So many people are alone this time of season, so and it's just so much harder. But it is a, a Christian's uh, job is to, uh, I guess it's our job to seek them out and help them actually uh, see the true meaning of it and just to be happy and stuff. I mean, to show some of our happiness. And I mean, I guess me, myself, I can be grumpy at times too if I go to a store and spend $1,000. <laughs> so that's just grumpiness and stuff. But I, for me, it pays off whenever like my grandkids or something, uh, they open up something and... So yeah, I might be a grump at times and stuff like that, but it just pays off in the end and stuff. And it shows me exactly what it's for. But also, I know that's not what the season's for, but it does make us happy. I mean, the biggest, I mean, reason this season is, is to remember we're saved. And there is a, nothing that we can do to repay that, but we can help others see, I mean, the, how we are saved by that. So, uh, I don't know, I just want to share that with about how things are magnified this time of season, whether it's happiness or sorrow. Uh, and the songs, that is. I mean, like, go tell it on the mountain. I mean, me, I love to be going around screaming it all up too and stuff like that, but I guess it's just not me. Uh, I'd like it to be, it's just not me. Uh, I was just talking to Brent about this and stuff, because uh, I'm not much of a speaker. I don't seem to, I, I'm not comfortable up here, but it seems every place I go, God is putting me in places like this and in front of people and speaking. So whether or not I think I'm comfortable there, he's got a purpose for me. And I mean, I thank him for it, even though I get nervous about it. Uh, I've been to baptize, baptisms and I mean, I've been in front talking to people that I just don't know. You know, sometimes it might be easier people I don't know. I don't know. But making a fool of myself, I don't usually put it pretty good at times. So. Amen. <laughs> Hey, I'll sing again. So okay. You know. <laughs> okay. Well, as we go to prayer, we're going to remember uh, this season and what it truly means uh, to share our love with so many of them out there. It's not, uh, family is family. Strangers are family. You just got to treat everybody with love. So uh, if you'd like to bow your uh, head in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities, Lord, that you present to us each and every day. Help us be a light to those that are out there that we uh, can help <clears throat> through this season, Lord. We know that there's a purpose behind everything, and there's a time for everything. So each and every day, Lord, that uh, we face this world, I ask you, Lord, that help us understand why challenges are presented to us, the health or just the regular, everyday sadness and sorrows. Help us get through them and to... Uh, be a better person for those that uh, we come in contact with, Lord. And all the stuff that's going on around this world with all the wars, the hatred, help them understand, Lord, that this is not who we are, and that one day it will all change when we get them on. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 This is so much. What do you call a hippie's wife? What do you call it? <laughs> Mississippi. <laughs> I think you're going to say Lorna. No. <laughs> I can't.
can't say I'm a big fan of some of them, but I like that one. <laughs> yeah, brother, brother Herb is correct. God has hidden the things from the wise and the learned and given it to little children, amen? Yeah. And if we come to God as a child in humility, he will give us his wisdom, amen? Amen. All right. If you would turn with me in your scriptures to Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 1. And I already apologize to the Sunday school people because they're going to get a repeat today. Just, just in a little bit different format. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. It says, That same day Jesus went out, to the house, out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered by him, so that he got into the boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, The sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some of the seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. And other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up. But since they had no depth of soil, but the sun rose and they were scorched. And since they had no root, they were withered away. And other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has an ear, let him hear. So let's break that down a little bit. And luckily this is one of those where Jesus gives a parable and then he goes back later and explains it. Because even the disciples weren't getting it. Verse 3, he said, and he told them many things in the parables, saying, a sower went out to sow. If we're to understand this parable, first we need to understand that the seed never changed. Amen? Amen. It was the same seed. It was the soil that's different. And what is the seed? The seed is God's Word. The soil is the human heart. There were three types of the bad soil that Jesus spoke about here. And while they have differences, every one of them had the same major flaw. That major flaw was a lack of true repentance. Verse 4 said, And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came along and devoured them. And of course, in verse 19, Jesus goes on to expand on that. He says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what he is, what has been sown in his heart. This is what's sown along the path. Think for a second about the soil that Jesus is describing here. We've all seen a footpath, amen? Yeah. What's the major characteristic of the soil on the footpath? It's hard. It's been walked on a thousand times. It's packed down. Not only is this heart void of true repentance, it's hardened. When the seed hits it, what happens? It just bounces off. Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear. But these people not only have an ear, don't have an ear to hear, those are the guys that literally have their fingers in their ears going, la, 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 I can't hear you. Anyone who's had kids knows that one. Amen. Until something breaks that soil up, nothing's going to place the Word of God in it. Amen. In verse 5, Jesus says, other, feed, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up. But since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. 
And Jesus again expands on this in verse 20. He says, as for what was on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Now we think our shallow, our, our soil here in Ohio is pretty shallow, right? You only dig down five, six feet and hit water sometimes. But if you've ever seen Israel, if you've ever been there, there's a lot of places where the soil is only an inch deep. Maybe two if you're lucky. Under that, it's bedrock. So just imagine. Jesus points out a seed may spring up quickly in that soil. But when adverse reactions come up, there's no root to sustain that plant. A hard wind or a scorching sun can quickly destroy the plant in that much soil. And for the heart without true repentance, their faith withers and dies under adverse situations. When hard times hit or persecution comes for being a Christian, their house crumbles. He goes on to say in verse 7, other seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them. And again in verse 22, he expands on that by saying, as for what was sown among the thorns, <clears throat> this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and make it unfruitful. Just as before, the seed hits the ground and springs up quickly. You have a nice little sprout. But then it, just as quickly it gets choked out by the thorns around it. And a heart void of true repentance will not put God first. And God therefore will end up being very la the very the last thing in your life. Jesus mentions the deceitfulness of riches, and I don't think we have to think about that too far. We look at the rich and famous and how their power and their influence takes them over and all of a sudden they become their own God. Amen? Yeah. But this is not something that's void in the lives of everyday people. How many people do you know who just are chasing that, that better car? that better house and they get a bigger car payment and a bigger house payment and they're chasing the toys and all of a sudden their life is consumed by work. There's no more time for family. There's no more time for God. It's just work, 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 work to get all the things that you never have time to enjoy. <laughs> your job becomes your God. But Jesus also mentions here the cares of the world. What does he mean by cares? Of course, me being the nerd that I am, I had to go look up that Greek word. It's merimna, which literally means anxieties or cares or worries. You don't have to be rich to let the worries of life destroy you. Amen? In Matthew 6, 31, Jesus says this. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek what? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. But in our societies, our society today, not only are we anxious about what we're going to eat and what we're going to wear, we're anxious about everything. 
and we continue to fill our life with more and more things. And our kids have every sport under the sun, and we worry about getting them all the things instead of getting, giving them the wisdom that we need. Amen. Without true repentance, a true rebirth in Christ, then our heart is vulnerable to all these things. Amen? Yep. But thank God there is true repentance. Verse 8, Jesus says, And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Again in 23, he goes on further to say, As for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. It's interesting to note here that God makes sure that we understand He didn't create all disciples exactly the same. Amen? Amen. But we all will bear fruit. Any true disciple is going to bear not only fruit, but good fruit. Because when Jesus was talking about the bad teachers or those who will come around and lead you astray, what did He say? You will know them by their fruits. Now sometimes that's not immediately apparent. Sometimes we get duped. But we are to stay vigilant. Amen? Right. Repentance is the heart of the salvation God offers us. True repentance. Unfortunately, a great deal of our society does not know what true repentance even is. Pointing out that fact in the society that we lived in, most often gets you labeled as hater, legalistic. We could name on and on and on and on all the names that they would like to throw out. But I stand before you and you stand before the world charged by God to tell the truth. Yes. Not just the truth, the whole truth. Amen? We live in a society today where we have not tens, not hundreds, but thousands of preachers that will stand behind the pulpit and just say, invite Jesus into your heart today and you'll be saved. And that sounds good and pretty, but inviting Jesus into your heart is almost like adding an accessory onto something, amen? Jesus is not a handbag. <coughs> He's not a necklace. He's not an accessory that you add on to the life that you already have. Jesus is a replacement for the life that you already have. Amen? Yeah. Repentance is taught by so many folks today as nothing more than standing before God and asking Him to forgive you for your sins. Is that a part of repentance? It certainly is. If you have no godly sorrow in your heart for the sin that you've lived, you're not going to ever repent. Amen? But nowhere in the Bible will you find where it says, repent of your sins. It says, repent for the remission of your sins. Repent is not just turning away from your sin. Repenting is turning away from your sinful nature. Repent is turning away from the world and its ways. Amen? Mm -hmm. Repenting is turning away from everything that you have built around yourself. But it's not only turning away, it's turning to God. Amen? Turning away from the person and the persona that you have created for yourself and becoming who God made you to be. It's giving yourself over to God completely. God doesn't want a piece of you. He doesn't want half of you. 
He wants all of you. We say, and it's true, that salvation is a free gift from God. That it will cost you everything. It's given him everything that you are. Everything that you have. Everything that you will be. Everything that you were. And becoming what he wants you to be. God is not an accessory that you tack onto your life. He is the center of your life. And the center of who you are. Repentance is a complete surrender of your mind and your body and your spirit to God. It's the changing of your mind, the changing of the way you think, the changing of the purpose of your life. It's very literally rebirth. Because what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So I know there's got to be at least a couple folks in here say, well, PG, why is this a sermon in the middle of a church full of Christians? Wouldn't this be an outreach event message or fan of flame or something like that? Short answer is, I'm giving you this message because I believe God told me to. As I was preparing for this message, I have to be uh, honest, I had that question in my mind too. Of course, we have the video ministry. Who knows who's listening on the video ministry? And God may be speaking to them. But it's been my experience, it doesn't matter what church that you walk into, there's always going to be someone sitting in the pews who doesn't truly belong to Christ. Amen? There may be a visitor, maybe someone who's been here a couple of weeks. We literally have experienced where someone has sat in the pew for 30 years, and then all of a sudden God wakes them up. Because they got the full message. I don't know who God's speaking to. I certainly know that we all should wake up and make sure that we're on the right side of the horse uh, occasionally. I know from experience that there are a lot of folks who play Christian in church. Now some folks, they have a reason and they know exactly what they're doing. They come to church because they want to please a spouse or they want to please a family member or some other reason. And they know very well that they're not a believer. But not only do we have um, a talent as a human race for deception and deceiving other people, we also have a, an air and ability to deceive ourselves. Amen? There was a, a period of several years in my life where I played Christian, and I certainly wasn't one. I read the Bible, I prayed, I said the sinner's prayer probably a dozen times. I even went and sat in the pew for a while, but I was not ready to commit everything to God. I was my God. I was in control. My will was what was important. And I wanted to add God into my life because number one, I guess I wanted that fire insurance. Does anybody in here really wants to go to hell? 
I didn't. But not wanting to go to hell is not being saved. <coughs> Desiring to give your heart completely to God, that's where, where salvation comes in. Amen? Every time I said that sinner's prayer, I think I knew deep down that I just wasn't there. I felt God pulling me. I felt the need to be saved. I just wasn't willing to give everything that I was over to someone else. To give my will over to someone else. I was in my 30s before I finally realized that it had to be all or nothing. You can't belong to Christ and blatantly live in sin. You can't belong to Christ and live your life for yourself. We all have to come to that point where we make a decision we either belong to him or you belong to yourself. I hope you've all made that decision. If you would bow your heads with me. Whether you're here or whether you're watching the video ministry, if you haven't made that decision, I don't care if you've been in the church for the first time, or if you've been in the church for decades, if you haven't made that choice to give everything that you are, to give your soul, to give your will, your body, your mind, everything to God, then today is the day to make that decision. There's not a one of us in here is guaranteed to have tomorrow. Jesus said he would come like a thief at the night. If that's you, if you are ready to give your heart, to give everything that you are to Christ, I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a minute. But I need you to make sure that you understand. Saying a prayer is not going to give you salvation. Giving your heart to Christ is what saves you. The prayer that comes out of your mouth is just a declaration of what's already happened inside. If that's you, I want you to pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you forgive me of my sin. Lord, I know that I need you in my life, and I give everything that I am over to you. I ask you to replace my will with your will and help me to live for you the rest of my days to serve you and not myself <coughs> Lord I pray this in the name of Jesus every head still bowed every eye still closed if there's one person in here who has not made that decision to completely surrender to repent to Christ then I ask you to raise your head raise your hand and let me know who you are so we can help you get on your path to walk in with God. Would there be one? If you made that decision today in the video ministry, then I welcome you to the family of God. And I ask you to come here, 294. Um, Mount Vernon Avenue in Marion, Ohio. And speak with us. Let us help you get on your path to walking with God. But if you have a church nearby, if you're far away, or if you have a family church, you're certainly welcome to go to that church. Speak with a pastor. Let him know the decision that you've made. Let them help you. Because believe me, when you give your heart to Christ and you get everything that you are to Christ, Satan is not happy. And he will come after you. And God gave you, your brothers and sisters in Christ, to strengthen you and to help you in your walk. All right, you may raise your head. Brother Barry, would you lead us in the invitation? If you are 
in need of prayer, you're more than welcome to come down front, my right, your left, <clears throat> and my right, your left, come down, you can be alone with God, my left, your right, we'll have prayer warriors, don't forget that we have folks back in the prayer room, if you want to go back and pray and, and talk in a little more private setting, you're welcome to, and everybody else, I invite you to just pray in your seats for all those who need prayer, amen. Yeah, the girl, you won't just stand